Yes. I'm saying that today we should be picking up from where you left off with Dr. Kerr when she had her class last with you. Now, I, I know that there was some confusion there. I'm not even sure what was the reason for the confusion, but I know that there was some confusion. But some persons had not got to her class. I hope, though, that you have seen the video. Were you able to? Did you go online? You were at the class? Okay. So those, are, those persons who were not there, did you see the video of the lesson? Did you have a chance to look at it? I don't know if you of the lesson. There is? Well, I was actually seeing the class online. You were seeing the class online. There's some videos, but I don't see one of the lesson. If it's on Orville, it's on Orville? No, it's not on Orville. Okay. It's, it's, at the, it's at the site that. Did you upload it in the video? Yes, okay. Yeah, the video is. Yes. It's at the site that you would normally go to to see the lesson? I don't remember the video. Yes, there are around three videos. Yes. On VOK and some of the. No, no, those that's that's the videos on our video that I have put there for this course. I'm talking about the video recording of the lesson that Dr. Edwards Kerr did. So that entire class, that lesson, if you were not here for the for that day, I'm saying that recording is up. And you should you should you should you should have a chance to I don't know if you can actually no. stop from where you probably just don't have that link that you're talking about though. But well, you should have that link, yeah. is the point I'm making. That's oh, a link oh. where all the classes that are recorded are uploaded. That's so we've never accessed any other classes before. Oh, I mean, I've got to the classes. Yeah, so it's kind of the EDU partners on YouTube, and you'll see. It's the first video here. Just Please, yeah. can, you, can, you, can you give us the, the URL again? Sure. Write this down. It's https colon https colon slash slash www dot slash www slash watch yes we have that watch question mark v question mark v yeah v equals equal capital r Capital R. Common Z. L O U X. L O U X. What's the capital that you mean? Capital N. Capital N. Capital N. Capital N. N L R caps. N L R. N L R caps lock. Okay. Yeah. And common Z four. Common Z four. What's the name of the page though? No, you better you better tell me the name because that will be much easier to know. You find us. Because you want to make an EDU partner. Yeah, I want to go and draw me the EDU partner. So the video is Alright, so guys, if you're hearing me there, please indicate that you're hearing the, um, the address for you to go to look at the lesson that was video taped. Can you type it in the chat? Sure. Yes, we'll type it in the chat. Thank you. So I'm going to assume that you have not seen the video. Well, I was here, so. Oh, you were here, excellent. And, um, and so persons who are not here, please have a look at it. Because, you know, that's, that was a very important base that was laid, a very important lesson that you really need to have. To, you need to get the concepts in that lesson. I'm building on that today. Now, I note that some of you are still not familiar, you're not, you haven't got, got a handle on how we're operating and I think we're operating at sort of cross purposes. The way we operate is that, well, let me say for myself, for my courses, I, I work with a schedule and I upload the schedule at the start of the course. The schedule has dates and it has the topics and it usually has the assignment points for you know the course. 
it also has the readings and it's called the schedule. That's separate and apart from the course outline, which is also uploaded, and the assignments, and those are also uploaded. So every course that I teach you, well, I have one more for the science students, EDSC 5401, which you, I will have you on Wednesday. That information is already there. Right? That means that you should know when we're having classes, what topic we're going to do at each point, what you're supposed to read, what the assignments are, and when they should be handed in. All right? So, and, and if there's a change, if I make a change, then you go onto the course page and you look at the news forum. The news forum will give you information each time there is an adjustment, if there's anything, that's where you go. So when you go on the course page, you must check the news forum. Right? Because any change that I make, that's where I put it. All right? So I believe that some persons, you're not, you aren't, you're, you're not seeing things. So you're asking me all sorts of questions. Now my, I, like I said, I had thought that I would have been assigned to teach the group on Wednesday because that's the group I had for the previous course. But the science group has a class on Wednesday. And I could be in two places at the same time. So they switched. And I just didn't know that. I thought you were going to be Tuesday, Thursday for your class. To be Wednesday, Friday. And that's the reason why I'm here this morning. Okay? Now, Dr. McCallum will teach the class on Wednesday. All right? The third point I want to make is... Yes. So, excuse me, miss. You're going to teach a science class on Wednesday? Yes. Right. And Friday? Yes. Okay, so yes. we, the science students will have a Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday and, and Friday. Friday. Okay. All right. All right? The third point I want to make is that the class is scheduled for Wednesday at 2, I think it is, to yeah. 7. Two to 7. All right. Now, I want you to think about whether or not you want to make that class earlier in the day. You don't have to answer me yet. That'd be great. Some persons may not, it may not be possible. If it is not possible, we work with it. All right? But if it is possible, then if we could make it a little earlier or a couple hours up so we don't go until 7, that would be something that you could consider. I don't think that students were very well at night. That made it. Why is that true? Huh? What's that? Someone has a comment? Is there anyone who has a comment? Not in the mornings either. <laughs> All right. No. But there are some people. Okay. Asleep. I'm a morning person, so <laughs> I guess I'm biased. That's a real question. I'm a Friday class. I mean, there are some persons who are secondary, so they're set up by a certain time. Yeah. Yeah, so, especially. Yeah. I thought of that too. It would work better for them, but some people were today. I thought of that. I thought that some persons may find it difficult to go until 7 on Fridays. Um, so if we start a little earlier, maybe, if, suppose we start at, if not at, not at two, but we start at um, one. one, would that work? One to six. Even if we can't, even if we can't go early in the morning, can you, can you make it for one? Yes. Sorry. It's okay. And Monique, Monique okay. you have to respond to this too. Are you okay with one o'clock, one to six, Jamaica time? Um, actually, 12 to 5 Jamaica time. 12 to 5. Yes, that was great. 12 to 5 Jamaica. That would be good for me too. That was excellent. Okay. okay. No, it's, and it's unless you're a person who can't make it at 12. But that's fine for me. And that's both days. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Is that, is that okay? 
Excellent. So we have negotiated. And we have done that. All right. So here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to start the morning with um, uh, a, a quick recap. And you're going to recap by sharing with me what it is that you have done for the assignment that I had given you online. And then I'm going to go into the major part of the lesson. So I had asked you to do an activity. And based on your subject groups, you're supposed to do that for presentation today. So I'm going to leave you now. Um, I understand that the science group, you have two presentations. And the math group, they have not responded to my appeal. So we'll go with that. And then I will lead off from that. What do you said two presents? Well, whatever. Yes, somebody said that earlier. I have I two four points, yes, but it's one it's one group with well, presenting What are you doing? Do it. Okay, no problem. Um, what do you mean to say the math group has not? <laughs> when I when I spoke earlier, oh you weren't here. You're in the math group? Yes, sir. You have a you have a you have you have a, you have a an activity for us? No, yes, sir. Excellent. No. When I spoke earlier, nobody responded. No, because I wasn't. Here, oh, well, apparently, because <laughs> everybody else here is saying I'm the only one. But no, but people and I were there oh. and nobody responded. So I assumed that it wasn't done. But I'm glad that something has been done. Yes, we All have right, to so let's. Organize. You have it up, but why did you speak? Because we were not, I was not there at that time. Oh, you weren't there. All right. So two persons yeah. are here. Excellent. I'm happy for that. Okay, science, let's go. We, 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 want, we don't want to take. We don't want to go beyond the um, system. We don't want to go beyond the left or All right, so. We're waiting on the we're waiting on the computer here. I mean, I'm So you know what we're doing. The science group is about to present, but the computer is reading the um it's not reading their it's not reading the what's it that you call it? Don't try. I'm not gonna try it. That's it. That's the only thing you have done. Um, is there anyone from the science group who has the, the presentation? You can go on your internet, go in the email. Oh. 
No, what's on here, you'll see your email on the screen. What's on here? Only the persons here are saying that. Okay. But there's no way. That is funny. That is a thing.
is a conference. The science group has worked so hard to put this presentation together. <laughs> yes, and so the members of our group, of our board, is, is now here to present our rendition, or revolution, or everything. So, so, so move our children forward into the future, into the modernized generation. Yes, these are our group members, and our main speakers for today are Shoshana Ellington, Ms. Shanice Tindale, Mr. Mark Burnett, Monique McClucky, Ryan Watts, Justin Williams, and Lisa Gay Van. Oh. So yes, let's get into it. Uh, we're still there. Let's begin with our synopsis of the web web um something web of knowledge. Oh, thank you. So the <laughs> All right, so to begin with, depth of knowledge, which is often called DOK, is the complexity or depth of understanding that is required to answer or explain an assessment related item. There are quite a number of ways to assess the depth of knowledge with different guidelines. But for this presentation, we'll be using Norman Webb's classification of depth of knowledge. In Webb's classification, there are four stages. They're as follows. So the first one is recall and reproduction. So at this level, students are required to recall facts or a rote application of simple procedures. These tasks do not require any cognitive effort beyond remembering the correct answer. And verbs are normally used at this level, as in the verbs carry out, they include calculate, describe, define, explain, identify, illustrate, etc. The second one is skills and concepts. Now at this level, students will now have to make decisions about their, their approach. Tasks at this level have more than one mental steps. Now the verbs that are normally used at this level include calculate, compare, compute, describe, distinguish, estimate, explain. And if you realize, there's kind of an overlap with the verbs for, for recall and, and skills and concept. However, to know, the, to know when, to, to know which one is being talked, spoken about, the number four for skills and con concepts, there are more than one mental step. So you know, based on what is being asked, if it's more than one mental step, you know that. Now the third. Can everybody hear? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Right. Yes. The third is strategic thinking. At this level, students will need to plan using evidence and thinking. I'm sorry, at this level, students will need to plan using evidence, and at this level, thinking is more abstract. So these tasks have multiple valid responses and students must justify their choices. Now the verbs which are normally used at this level include appraise, assess, compare, conclude, contrast, decide, describe, etc. The fourth one is extended thinking. This level requires the most complex cognitive effort. It requires the synthesis of information from multiple sources, usually over an extended period of time, or a transfer of knowledge from one domain to solve problems in another. Now, the verbs which are normally used at this level include appraise, connect, create, design, justify, prove, and synthesize. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christine. And now we'll have uh, Ms. Ellington. She'll guide us through by, by providing us with the general input side. Um, so we came up with five aims, and they include one, achieving science literacy, and what curriculum are you using? The rose curriculum. Um, maybe you should tell 
persons who are not Jamaicans, what is the rules curriculum and where is it used? Yeah, but junior high school. Yeah, the rose. Let me just give you a little background to rose. Rose stands for Reform of Secondary Education, and the reform began officially in 1993. The plan was to have a common curriculum for grades seven to nine in all our secondary schools. So secondary schools as well as schools that were not considered secondary. Some schools that were the all age schools had students up to grade nine. They had students from primary to grade nine. And the 79 component of those schools were also required to use the rules curriculum. Prior to that, there was no common curriculum used by students at the lower secondary levels. And as such, the government of Jamaica had this massive project that was research informed and this curriculum was implemented. The curriculum was meant to follow constructivist pedagogy and the curriculum used for, for the most part in science and mathematics and all the subjects and inquiry of course teaching and instruction. There were some common features in that curriculum. For example, there's pieces of language, language being used across the curriculum. There was a business of use of cooperative learning groups as a means of, you know, organizing for instruction. The curriculum also targeted different levels of students. So you had students who were performing at the average, below average, and above average levels, and special activities were designed for those students. This curriculum um, is at this point being phased out because the government of Jamaica is now, has now undertaken a new what is called a national standards curriculum. The national standards curriculum is one that has been, is, is um, addressing primary right through to grade nine. The expectation is that grades 10 and 11, the students will continue with the CSA curriculum. And so the, the national standards curriculum will take the place of rows at 79 and will also take the place of what had been in place, which was called the new revised primary curriculum in one to six. And that new curriculum is due to be implemented on a, on a relatively, on a phased basis starting September of this year. So what we're looking at is the rows which was which preceded this new stand, national standards curriculum. Mr. Hart, yeah, but e-learning was not really a, it was not it was not curriculum as such. E-learning was to use was to the the, 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 the content that was used for e-learning was based on what was there. You with me? Yeah. This is the first, the first curriculum since rules is the National Standards Curriculum. So the first thing we're looking at achieve giving scientific literacy and by doing this we expect to students to explore the scientific approach in resolving problems. Um, because there's no one way of doing science, we think students really explore a new different approach to solve problems. Um, so you should become a um, person with the scientific meaning of popular words in science, like hypothesis, um, theory, etc. So you should also realize that language skills are utilized in communicating scientific information. Two, they should be able to develop how thinking and process skills. By doing this, uh, we expect um, the different views of the, um, methodologies, including group work. Um, this could be like Socratic, um, Socratic-based learning, uh, 
service learning, more students oriented. So you have students with probably 80% of the work is so the, the, the traditional teacher. Chalk on top, where teacher will do 80% and the students will do on the next 20%. You have students more involved in this curriculum. Um, three, we expect uh, students to develop science and technology awareness. Students should be aware of the, the new technologies, the new um, science discoveries, merge both together. This will, of course, help to build um, new activities, construct their own physical representation of their scientific concepts. And four, students should be able to see the importance of their individual roles in protecting the environment. Um, students should be aware of sustainable development. Um, they should, should be able to conserve, protect, and preserve the environment going forward. So you should be able to develop an awareness of the wide range of career options available to people with the scientific skills and by doing this, you should be aware of different um, areas like genetic engineering, which is growing, uh, processing, research, and the list continues. All right, and in order for us to implement these strategies in the minds of our students, we have decided to infuse web's depth of knowledge in the most curriculum and so we have come up with um, come up with some uh learning outcomes which will be done by the violence national Unity group who our main our first speaker is mark mr bernays you can take a look here okay good morning can everybody hear me clearly Yes. yes. Okay, so I'll be looking at the first four learning outcomes. Now, before I go into them individually, let me just say firstly that um, the, learning, the, the learning activities and assessments that are provided are not limited to just what is on the slide. There are many other learning activities and assessment that can be done when you're looking at the topic classification. So these are just a few that have been listed here. Um, looking at the first learning, learning outcome, uh, when students finish the classification unit, they should be able to explain the importance of grouping things. And uh, a, a learning activity that can be done is that students can be provided with different objects and, and they can group them based on their similarities. Now, if you look at the activity by itself, without uh, being guided by a teacher, you might ask yourself the question, how is it that students can actually get to see the importance of grouping things by just um, carrying out that activity? But if the teacher guides the student, um, to the learning outcome. So for example, in, at, at the end of the, of the activity, give the students an example, illustrating and explaining one um, importance and I'm going to give you an example. Let's say I am going to buy, I would like to buy a shoe, a pair of shoes. So I'm, I'm going into a shoe store and I would like to buy a pair of shoes. But in that store, they have not grouped the shoes based on the pair, based on sizes. They just have the shoes anyhow lined up in the, in the store. For me, going into that store, let's say I'm wearing size nine. I'm looking for a shoe that is size nine, but they have no, um, here that has size nine, they just have the shoes laid out, any color, any size, one pair here, one pair there. The experience of trying to get a shoe would be very tedious because the shoes are not being grouped based on size, um, based on type, maybe based on color. So for me, that would be, uh, the process would not be as efficient as it would be um, if the, the shoes were grouped based on sizes, um, maybe based on color, based on type, style, etc. So. The teacher bringing that, that together will give the students an understanding to actually see the importance of different things. And in that case, that's just an example, shoes, for example. A good assessment that uh, can be done is that students can actually uh, be given the opportunity to make a list whereby they can group things that are important and justify why, each, um, why it is important to, to group this, the things in each place named. Um, a learning out the second learning outcome could be that students can be given the opportunity they should be able to differentiate between living things and non-living things. And a very interactive learning activity can be you present students with a motor vehicle. It can be a car, 
um, and an animal, it can be maybe a dog, let's say, and they observe the dog and look at the different features, and the car, and they look at the different features of the, um, of the, both the car and the, and the dog, and they write that, the features down, and then begin to discuss maybe in groups, um, stating why the dog is living and why the car is not. And let me just say that um, for the students to be able to do this, they must be given that, that baseline information or they must be taught um, characteristics of living things. So for example, they must know that living things must be able to reproduce, uh, they must be able to respire, etc. So that must be taught before the students can be able to carry out this learning activity. Um, also, in terms of assessment, it is very good to um, engage students into fun and meaningful learning, um, especially at this, at this grade level. So putting students into, into groups and, them, and having them create a game or a song uh, so that they can express their understanding of the characteristics of living things while um, us as a teacher uh, assess them for the creativity and how they present. Um, that would be a good um, assessment of fun and interactive and meaningful assessment that they can do at that age. Um, another, if I should, let me see. Yes. Um, another uh, a learning activity that can be done is that in small groups, um, they, they make observation of the things around the compound and they compile and make a list of them and when they come back to the class they actually state you know what are what are living things which which from the list are living things and which from the list are non-living things another learning outcome the third learning outcome which is number three classify living things into plants and animals what students can do as a learning activity for this one is that in groups they can actually discuss the differences between plants and animals, and then uh, justify why why you would put a plant separate from an animal. So, for example, a simple justification can be um, plants ca are are capable of making their own foods while animals are not. So, plants should be put in a different uh, grouping from that of animals. And so, in that in that way, you can assess students' ability to critically think based on the characteristics that plants have, and 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 and, and that of the the animals. Um, for assessment, a teacher made test can be done, and with respect to the, D, um, the, the, depth, the, okay, the depth of knowledge, but in that test you can cover the first, um, the first three levels, they, they recall uh, skills and concepts and strategic thinking, so you can ask questions to cover that aspect um, of the, the depth, depth of knowledge. And finally, with respect to the, 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 the last learning activity within Three, um, number three is that you can separate students. Um, well, students can separate the animals from the plants uh, that they have in the list given previously, and then as an assessment, they can prepare a report. Um, and in that report, what they can identify is, you know, from the list that they have, they can state what they can classify the organisms into living, non living. They can state um, why they would do that. What is the um, for them, they can give the importance of that object that they classified um, within the area. And a, a, a good example of this can be, let's say they're going around the, 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 the school compound and they saw maybe a plant. What they can do is say, um, for example, this, this, is a, this is a living thing. It's a plant. It's not an animal. It's a plant. And then they can say possible importance or possible use. So the importance can be that it's providing oxygen maybe for us to breed or it's a habitat for organisms to live in or maybe it's just holding the soil together, possible importance or let's just say uh, they, they saw maybe a bottle, a non-living thing, possible use, possible harmful effect, maybe um, putting harmful chemicals into the earth, into the soil. So within that report that they're being done, that, is, that the students are doing, they can um, cover all these aspects so that you can see how well they can actually critically think and evaluate based on the things that they've observed within the environment. The, well, the final assessment that I'll be looking at is grouping plants into flowering and non-flowering. And you can actually take students on a field trip. It doesn't necessarily have to be around the, the school compound, but it can, it can be um, maybe in the botanical gardens and have them observe different plants uh, and then classify them in the monocots and dicots. And um, a good assessment that can be done for the students is that you can actually give them the opportunity to um, be in a laboratory uh, setting. So you introduce them to the lab and then you have you present them with various um, plants 
and you have them and you give them a dichotomous key and have them identify which plant is a monocot, which plant is a dicot, um, having them within that laboratory setting acting as a mini scientists trying to figure out what is a um, trying to group organism. Now, for all, if you notice, for all of the assessments and the, uh, sorry, for all of the learning activities that were listed, the students must be taught the basic the information before so that they can effectively go out and um, and do what is and, and carry and group the organisms based on monocot, dicot, etc. So the, the information must be taught before. So I'll now hand you over to the next um, person that will be continuing with learning outcome five. Thank you, Mark. Um, sorry, but before you go, you guys can tell me. Are you going to classify these activities according to web COP further on? Somebody will do that. Right. Oh, um, it is actually it is actually done on the last page, but I can I can well, do that. That's fine. I can do that now. No, 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 no. That's fine. I just wondered if you had you were going to do it later okay. on or because uh, that's fine. Okay. Hi everyone. Oh. Hi, Molly. Uh, Kim, move to um, slide number five. Learning outcome number five. For learning outcome number five, we expect students to be able to group flowering plants into monocotyledons and dicotyledons. For the learning activities, we'll ask students to create a plant scrapbook and insert and identify the monocotyledonous plants and the dicotyledonous plants. So um, on the same field trip that they went outside and uh, collected plants, we'll just, use, we'll just ask them to group those plants into di dicots and monocots in the scrapbook. and um, while they're doing that, we'll ask them to highlight the major differences between the two types of plants. For the assessments, <coughs> uh, the teacher could prepare a chart and ask the students to group them based on um, things like uh, leaf variation, types of root, uh, how the leaves are on the stem, and um, ask them to also justify the reasons for placing those plants into the various groups. We'll also ask our students to group non-flowering plants into conifers, ferns, and algae, and mosses. The students will work in a group to construct a dichotomous key. I know Mark mentioned dichotomous key already, but for those who don't know, it's just a tool that allows users to determine and identify items by, um, by using a series of choices that leads to the correct name. And uh, the dichotomous key, you usually give them uh, two choices or two options. So, um, <clears throat> for example, you can say this plant has um, large flowers and the other plant does not have large flowers or the petals might be brightly colored or dull uh, colored petals. And then um, each student will, based on the characteristics, then they could uh, group the, the plants. Um, that <clears throat> the depth of, depth of knowledge skills that, um, that that requires is skills and concept and strategic thinking as well. For um, move up. And for grouping plants into conifers, ferns, and algae, you allow them to allow them to use a key that you'll distribute, and then ask them to place um, to place uh, flowering plants into either A, B, C, D, or whatever. And students will also identify whether the key given is a dichotomous key. And as I explained before, dichotomous key means that you, you give them uh, different options or different choices, like two different choices. Move up to number six, number seven, I mean. And also we'll ask students to classify animals and vertebrates in animals into vertebrates or invertebrates. To do this, we'll ask them to discuss and construct a table of differences between the vertebrates and invertebrates. And um, for learning assessment, we could ask them to, we could give them various, um, <coughs> various types of um, animals, like live animals or preserved animals, and then ask them to, to classify them based on, let's say this plant has um, a backbone or 
no, I'm sorry, <laughs> animals. Animals with backbone or animals without backbone, we could ask if the animals have shells or um, no shells. And um, this will also draw on their skills of uh, recall because they'll be able, they'll need to be able to um, remember the different, the differences between, between vertebrates and invertebrates. And they'll also need to use skills and concept because then they'll have to compare between the vertebrates and invertebrates, as well as use strategic thinking to, to um, explain why they classified them as they did. Uh, someone else is doing from learning outcome number eight. Okay, morning everyone. Morning. Right. So looking at learning outcome number eight. Um, students should be able to identify and describe different vertebrate groups in terms of mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, and reptiles. Now, the learning activity for this is that the teacher would allow the students to browse the internet and look at the various vertebrate groups where they will discuss different types, their characteristics, and habitats. Um, this activity is a good activity that facilitates learning by discovery, and the students are allowed to discover the different features of the different groups on their own. Um, the assessment for this activity would be that students will be placed in groups of, in five groups, where each group will be given a particular vertebrate group to research and make a presentation. On the Wells DOK, this activity type of assessment will entail skills and concepts, short-term strategic thinking, as well as extended learning. Right, learning outcome number nine. Um, so you will identify and describe the types of invertebrates into analytes, mollusks, echinoderms, and arthropods. And for this, the learning activity for this would be that uh, students will be allowed to watch a video presentation on invertebrates. And they will write down in their notebooks the different features, the characteristics, and the different types of vertebrates. It will also identify places where these invertebrates can be found. Um, the associated assessment for this would be that students would write a story pretending to be a named invertebrate. Uh, the story should include the type of invertebrate they are, where they are, where they live, what they eat, and any special features they may have. Um, the web step of knowledge for this would be skill concept as well as extended thinking. All right, and the tenth learning outcome would be grouping living things into solids, liquids, and gas. Um, the learning activity for this would be students will observe an illustration of a car. From that car, they would identify a part that is made from solid, a part that is gas, and a part that is liquid. So they will also name the solid, name the liquid, and also name the gas they have identified above. The assessment for this would be that students could create a collage depicting three non-living groups, solid, liquid, and gas, using labels of household items uh, that may contain a different states, different groups. Yeah, um, for the web's depth of knowledge for this activity, it involves recall and reproduction, as well as skills and concepts. All right, now at the end of this unit, the students may also be asked to develop a concept map uh, based on all that they have learned. All right, and the website of knowledge for this will be recall and reproduction. The teacher can also administer tests and classification at the end of the unit. And based on the structure of this test, uh, it will draw on recall and reproduction, skills and concepts, as well as short term and strategic thinking. Recap of the assessment activities of the web. Okay. okay, so um, summarizing the web's DOK for all the different assessments that were mentioned earlier. Assessment one involved recall. Um, assessment two involved skills and concept. Assessment number three.
called recall season concepts as well as strategic thinking. Assessment number four, strategic thinking as well as extended thinking. Assessment number five, skill and concept. Assessment number six, skill concept and strategic thinking. Assessment number seven, skill concept and strategic thinking. Assessment number eight, skill concept. Assessment number nine, skill concept, strategic thinking as well as extended thinking. Assessment number 10, um, skill concept and extended thinking. Assessment 11, recall and skills and concept. Assessment 12, look at recall and assessment 13, recall skills and concept as well as strategic thinking. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so here we have tried to infuse lots of knowledge within the most curriculum and so have come up with these assessments and to, to be aligned with the web's depth of knowledge um, levels. Now, the campus group will take over our discussion today. Let's not delay, let's get into the meat of the battle with uh, Justin and Peter Gay. Okay, so Justin and I will be doing the chemistry section and the topic that the topics that we'll be looking at are elements, mixtures, and compounds. Now I just want to uh, bring to mind that the Rose curriculum actually overlaps with the new standard, uh, the national standard curriculum that will be implemented in September because we have attended the workshops two weeks ago. And for those of you in Jamaica who do not know, uh, the ministry is also running another workshop this week starting today and ending next week, Tuesday. Uh, it's actually interesting because it overlaps with the Rose curriculum and today we'll be looking at some of the learning outcomes, learning activities and assessments as well as the web, web the depth of knowledge, knowledge for this topic. So the first learning outcome for elements, compounds and mixtures Students will be able to describe an atom as the smallest piece of a pure substance that still has the properties of that substance. The suggested learning activity is that the students will be given a piece of string and will be asked to cut it until they are not able to do so anymore. The assessment now is that the students will be asked to define define and describe what is an atom. Students will be asked to think about whether or not the last piece of string can be divided further and if they recovered an atom of the string. Now, the DOK that we'll be looking at for this uh, learning outcome is recall and skills and concepts. Justin? All right, good morning, everybody. So I'm um, continuing. So the second learning outcome would be students will be able to identify and use chemical symbols to 
represent one atom of each element. Now, the learning activity which this involves, um, students will be asked to buy the first 20 elements of the periodic table in a song format. So that's a means of utilizing the certain skills that the student might have. That they will be they will make after making a list of the labeled element. Example, the atomic number, the mass number. And this is very important for them to understand, especially if they plan to major in chemistry. It's important to know the different elements and what the atomic number and the mass number is. Now the assessment for this is a worksheet will be provided on the first paper. So this really, according to Webb's depth of knowledge, requires for recall. About to. Okay, so the next learning outcome is that the students will be able to distinguish between a pure and impure substance. The learning activity that school suggests is that the students will be given the definition of pure and impure substances, and then an experiment will be conducted by the students. So, for example, we could give them uh, water and we could give them another container with some sugar in it or some salt. And then we'll ask the students if the water is pure or impure. They will suggest it to us and they will suggest if the salt is pure or impure. And then we'll ask them to combine it now, combine both of them. So the salt and water will mix together and then they will tell us uh, whether it is pure or impure and then suggest to us why is it that they um, decide that it is pure or impure. Now students will be asked for the assessment, the students will be asked to identify five substances around the house and asked to express justifying their answer if the substances are pure or impure. The web depth of knowledge that we'll look at for this section is that it's short-term, short-term strategic thinking. So Justin. All right, thanks again. So, um, for this next learning that will be have established for our students, that students will be able to identify or to define the term element, compounds, and mix and provide example of each. Now, the activity that would incorporate, students will be given the definition of the term and shown examples. And then the assessment following is a definition and this will be used to assess it the definition of the term in bold with different examples. Now students will be placed in group and so it is important at this stage that the students really have a proper understanding of it because I've realized this sometimes causes a lot of confusion when they move on to a great 10 and 11, which will be in chemistry. And so having this good background and good base allows for them to do much better. Now, this assessment goes on skills and comes from the web's depth of knowledge. Back to PTA. Yes, thank you, Justin. The next learning outcome is that the students will be able to explain the importance of compounds and describe how compounds are formed when two or more elements combine chemically. The learning activity is that students will be given a list of commonly used compounds and discuss their importance. Students will observe the reaction that occurs when sulfur and iron are heated together. The assessment is that the students will be given a list of simple chemical equations showing only reactant molecules. They will be required to complete each equation by stating which compound is formed. Now, the DOK that we'll be testing for here is skills and concepts. All right. So um, the next is students will be able to create a model of water molecule consisting of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. So it's one thing to have the teacher think, one thing for the teacher to draw it, 
put it on the board, but then when they can utilize their hands, and this you now sometimes is better learning. And so the activity would be that students will be provided with all of two sizes acrylic paints, paint brushes, food picks, and science books, and guided on creating the water molecule model. And so right here, I am positive when students are engaged in activity like this, it's very difficult for them to participate. And it, it, it is something that they can always do in their exam. But the assessment for this is a model construction of carbon that will be used as a student's level of understanding on compounds. And this assessment number six, it pulls on extended thinking on web set of knowledge. Okay, um, before we continue, I just want to state that you'll realize that the learning activities that we have suggested so far and the rest to come, they are actually student-centered. And this is what the, the NSC, which is the National Standard Curriculum, is actually aiming to do, make the classroom more student-centered instead of teacher-centered. Because uh, we find out that the teachers are actually doing a lot of things in the classroom and the students don't really get that hands-on. And so that's the reason why most of our activities will involve the students. The next learning outcome is that the students will be able to describe the characteristics of mixtures and provide examples of common mixtures. The learning activities that students will be presented with diagrams of mixtures with properties clearly stated. Common mixtures will be listed. The assessment, students will be paired and asked to market a business that sells chemical products, highlighting the type of mixture available and why the mixtures are classified as such. The BOK with depth of knowledge that we're testing for is extended strategic thinking. All right, sorry about that. The next learning outcome. Um, students will be able to differentiate or should be able to differentiate between homogeneous mixtures, heterogeneous mixtures, giving examples of each. And the learning activity to enforce the lesson would be each term defined. A short video will be used to illustrate the difference between the two mixtures. And two examples of each type of mixture will be given. Now, the use of video in this specific area, it's good when, you know, in a classroom setting, you might not necessarily demonstrate as best as these examples, but we can provide the student different means of providing it. Um, we can have it on a projection, and from there, even for them to recall, we can give them a new you and access. Now, the assessment, students will observe mixtures four beakers and indicate whether the mixer is homogeneous or heterogeneous. And again, now this pulls on skills and concepts from the web's depth of knowledge. Okay, the next learning outcome is students will explain the characteristics of a colloid and say it's one example of a colloid. The learning activity, students will be provided with a table stating the characteristics of colloids along with examples of common colloids. And the assessment is that the students will be presented with three types of mixtures labeled A, B, and C and asked to indicate the colloid giving reasons for their choice. All right. The assessment based on where's the the okay is skills and concepts. All right, thanks, Pete, again. And the, the last you now learning outcome is students will define a solution as a homogeneous mixture in components are evenly mixed. And the learning activity, students will be shown a beaker on the solution and use it to define what the solution is. So this is pulling from the previous knowledge that would have been taught earlier. And then the last assessment 
you know, students will be sent to a scenario where they are required to define the term solution orally to a new student. And now this now pulls from the web digital knowledge, recall thought term strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justin. And just to summarize to the table of all the um, assessments and the, the classification based on web step of knowledge. And this has been extended by our colleagues who have done a hard day's work. And it's time to go, people. So thank you, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for attending this conference and we, we uh, look forward to moving into the future with new thinking and new attitude. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I have some questions that I want to ask, but I'm going to ask them at the end because I may have the same questions for the math as well. So the four points are up here, right? You want to be just there on the system. I can find them. Right, so Mark, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and then at the end, I'll bring it together and see if we can answer some of the questions that I'm asking I would like to ask. So good morning, everyone, again. Um, we outlined about seven, six or seven general objectives for the mathematics curriculum. And the first one we have is to demonstrate the mathematical competence necessary to function in society. And this would include the students being able to recall or recognize mathematical facts. So we don't want a student who would be able to want a student who is able to recall the information and to be able to use it in a functional way in society. Also, a student who is able to recount, measure, and handle money. You know that money is a very functional tool in society and it's also a very important um, topic that is being visited in mathematics. So we want them to develop the skills of the use and how to measure and to measure money and its uses, etc. Also to conceptualize partial prop properties. So you know that um, we don't want them to think that math is just two dimensional. Math is also three dimensional. So we want all those concepts to be taught in our math <laughs> curriculum. Objective two, <clears throat> we want our students to be able to perform mathem mathematical manipulations. That would include the ability to do straightforward computations with confidence and accuracy. So we want students who are not dull and who are not feeling a little, um, who are not accurate when it comes to doing mathematical computations. We want students who are um, very proficient, confident in the methodologies, the algorithms that they use, etc. 
We want them to be able to manipulate mathematical ideas. So we don't want them to just be inside of the mathematical classroom, but you want them to go to think outside of the classroom. Our third objective would be that we want them to be able to demonstrate an understanding of mathematical concepts and processes. And this would include the ability to communicate ideas effectively. Math is not just a number subject, but it also involves a lot of critical thinking and reasoning. We want them to be able to transform from one type of representation to another. All right, so if you have worded problems, you want them to be able to use the information that is given. So information like all together, we want them to know that it most likely will mean addition. So from words to symbols and vice versa, equations to graphs, and we have a lot of that in mathematics. We want them to be able to apply mathematical knowledge and understanding to new situations. So both common and complex situations. All right, so <clears throat> we want them to be able to use a scenario. And are you still there? No, no, I'm not hearing her. Mic is on. Somebody else is on. Internet connection as well. Okay, all right. So just taking over until she returns. Um, general objective number four is use mathematics and mathematical reason to analyze given situation. This involves the ability to make conjectures, um, get information or numerical data needed for investigating or exploring an idea and arranging and presenting findings logically. As I said, we want to educate these persons to go into the real world and not only just to do math in terms of writing formulas, but to use their mathematical reading in any situation, whether they're in banking, computing, science, whatever the area may be, to see a situation where mathematics can be applied to make whatever the situation is much more easier for them. General objective number five to be able to select knowledge, information, and techniques that are needed to solve a particular problem, whether it's social, technical, or academic, and apply these in the actual situation of the problem. General objective number six, to appreciate the importance and relevance of maths as a necessary and valuable tool in everyday life. And this is something that we put a lot of emphasis on because persons nowadays they don't really see the necessity of but first when students are in the classroom they say why are we learning all of these things you know why we need to know this formula or why we need to study this topic so we want to make students appreciate maths more that's one of the objects that we have and to make it a valuable tool for them in the working and the social work all right, so here we're going into the learning objective, outcomes, and assessment and classifications. Um, the two topics that we are focusing on right here are focusing on angle triangles and polygons, and also functions and graphs. So the web depth of knowledge, and I'm going to kind of go over this since the science group have already went in depth into what web depth of knowledge is already. So we'll go straight into the learning outcomes and the activities. Okay, so the first one is for angles, triangles, and polygons. And when the learning outcomes, we wanted for students was to not only know about these things, but be able to compare, classify, measure, and construct these angles. And one of the learning activities that we did was to recap, because even though they have the knowledge of these angles from previous year groups, we want to reinforce. Sorry about that, guys. My internet. Is so we want to reinforce what they have already learned. And also, we want to teach them as well how to use the protractor in order for them to measure and also to construct angles. 
Or one of the things that we have to do, the teacher will go on the board and demonstrate to them and also highlight key points that they need to learn. For example, the outer scale, the inner scale, the center mark, and the zero edge. So the students need to know these terms when it comes down to actually using the projector so these terms play a key role. Also, in assessments, we're doing both informal and summative assessment. The teacher will go around and observe how the students actually measure or construct their angles. And in the teacher going around and looking at the students, we will know where the key area is in which the students are having difficulty. In the case that they're having difficulty reading the protractor or the case that they're having issue in terms of where to put the center mark or whatever the case may be. Also, we doing summative assessment in terms of giving them a little worksheet to do, probably to identify and measure, identify the angles, measuring the angles, and also vocabulary, let's say the key terms, you know, what, what is the protractor, what is it used for, and this will be done in terms of multiple choice and matching. And the web depth of knowledge that we are using or applies to this is recall and reproduction. All right, the next learning outcome is identify the various types of angles. And as I see, we have a bracket angles when lines meet, because there's a lot of different types of angles. But angles that we're focusing on with angles when lines meet and the sum of angles. Now, what the teacher will do is to go in and define two key terms when it comes down to angles when lines meet the traversal line and parallel lines. Because those are the traversal line and the parallel lines are what create the angles when the line meets. So the teacher will go on with the aid of a diagram to actually explain the different types of angles and also ask the students if they analyze anything particular about it. And from that discussion, what the teacher will do is to link particular angles to particular letters. For example, vertically opposite angles, you normally notice that they are from letter X, opposite side. For alternate angles, you notice they are from a Z. And so teachers will link the various angles to the first letter that help the students to be able to link it and to apply that when they get the diagram, they can look out for these various letters and remember it to what they have learned. Um, again, the assessment that we do, we always do informal assessment because math is practical. So going around and looking and observing how the students do their work, we'll know where the students fall short in order to know that we should go over the topic again or to reinforce the topic. Also, summative assessment in terms of the students to be able to identify the angles. Also, in terms of finding missing angles as well. Because since the students already have the concept that based on what the type of angles are, for example, vertically opposite angles, they know that whatever one side is, the other side should be as well. So if they say 45 on one side, that means that one side should be on the other side. So we want to apply those thinking and reasoning to the students. So we give them finding missing angles. So we can multiple choice and matching again. Um, the web depth of knowledge we use is recall and reproduction and skills and concepts. Okay, the next one is identifying and drawing different types of polygons. So what will happen is that the teacher is going to divide, define what a polygon is and then divide the class into groups. And what's going to happen is that we're going to give the students a bunch of manipulatives, and based on the definition of what they know the polygon is, the students will pick out of the manipulatives what their thing based on the definition of why they think it's a polygon. Because there's not only the teacher require them to only pick out, but the teacher expect them to explain why they think it's a polygon. Also, going to the assessment, as I said, informal assessment will be observing students identify polygons in selecting manipulative, and also there's going to be a performance based assessment for this one. In terms of what require the students to draw the polygon this time, so we're not asking them to define anything to record, and to define anything on the start or match anything or to select a response. We want them to actually to draw the polygon and actually to name them. So for this web depth of knowledge, we're using recall and reproduction. Okay, for well, the next learning outcome is to calculate the sum of interior angles for polygons. And for this, lots of different learning activities. Um, the first one teacher will go into to demonstrate why a triangle measure 180. And when you're doing the sum of an interior angle, you must know what a, why it 
where we, the formula is for n minus 2 times 180. And what we want to do, we don't want to just give the students the formula just like that. We want to, the students to develop the formula for themselves and to see why is it that we, as math teachers, do this formula. So what is going to happen? That the teacher will draw a polygon on the board and from one vertex to other vertices, the students will be drawing a diagonal line and then the students will realize this and their observation that in every single polygon there is a triangle. There's more than one triangle in it. And then based on the knowledge that the teacher demonstrated that the triangle measure 180, the students can then develop their own formula from the observation. Also, the, the teacher will highlight that there is a relationship between the number of triangles within the polygon and the number of sides when it comes on to the polygon. So the polygon will have five sides, but the triangle inside of it is only five three. So they realize that it's less by two for every single polygon. There is two less triangles. So from that, the student, with the aid of the teacher, will arrive at the formula to calculate some interior angle, which is n minus two times 180. From that, the teacher will be doing an informal assessment of them and the students work together to find the formula. But as I said before, it is not the teacher will be into them. The teacher will just explain various concepts and the students will link everything together for what they learned and the teacher along, along with working with the students will arrive at the formula. It will be a performance-based assessment in which students will be required to explain why the sort of interior angle is formula is n minus 2 times 180. Also, students will be required to explain with example if the number of sides can be formed with a given sum of interior angle. So here we take it another step further. So even though we have shown them how to calculate the sum of interior angle, we want to know in the case that we turn it around, that if they, knowing how to find the sum of interior angle, will be able to find the number of sides as well. So the web depth of knowledge using is recall, reproduction, skills and concepts, and strategic thinking. All right, so from that, we'll go into functions and graphs. So the learning outcome, at the end of the day, the student should be able to construct a quadratic graph. And what the teacher will do is explain and to demonstrate using examples of how to find the x and y intercept, intersect, sorry, from the quadratic e equation. And what the students, what the teacher will do is to observe the students as the sketches of what I said, math is a practical subject as well, and practice, practice, along with some reasoning. So as we observe the students doing the assessment will know where they fall short and to work on it. All right, so we'll be using a performance-based assessment in which students will be required to draw graphs and give the value of x and y from activity in the math textbook. And the DOK for this is skills and concept. The next learning outcome is to write a quadratic mapping as a set of ordered pair. The first thing the teacher will do is to go into the state, what is the ordered pair? and to introduce the formula for graphing a quadratic vertex from, from a mapping rule, which is y equals a x minus h to the square plus k. The teacher will go into explain what is the order here for students to understand and to introduce the formula to them and how we can use the order here along with the formula. So again, we're doing an informal assessment and performance-based assessment which students will be required to accurately complete a table of values for any quadratic function within a specific range for x. And that includes recall and reproduction and skills and concepts. The next learning outcome for functions and graph will be plotting the other pairs of a map, mapping as a graph. So again, students will be given a graph sheet to label x and y, because what we're doing, we're just working out from knowledge that the pre from the previous class that students already know. So the basic what we're doing is to remind the students about what is the order here, which one comes first, the x or the y, and the teacher will go in that revision with the class, and then the teacher will give the students the graph paper and they will be required to plot the graph. So that will be our performance assessment, and the DOK for this is skills and concept. And that's it for this.
conversation. All right. Thank you very much, Matthew. All right. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew. In some instances, a little bit beyond where I had wanted you to go to, but you have done a fair amount in terms of the activities. You have spent some time looking at the activities. You have um, done extensive you know, work in that area. And you have classified the activities. One of the things that I don't think you managed very well, both groups, was the movement from the objectives to the learning outcomes. All right, so you, you'll perhaps get some more time on that. So the, you, you presented the objectives or you presented the aims, but I'm not sure that you showed the link in terms of how you moved. The math group was closer to that in that they had their journal objectives and they went through their specific objectives. But then from your specific objectives to your learning outcomes, that's where we wanted to have seen the, yeah. the link. So you, you didn't you didn't show me that link, but Anon, you will you will do more of that, you know, you get some more of that. You know? The important part of this activity though for this course was for you to look at your assessment activity and to classify according to Webb's DOK. And I think that you have done that fairly well. I think for the most part, you have got the classifications. I'm going to have to look back at them again in my quiet moments to make a judgment overall. But I think you got that part well. Um, I wanted to ask you some questions now about why you did what you did. And the first thing I wanted to ask was, well, let me stop with Matt, because they, 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 um, they called some activities performance activities and informal activities, all right? And you also use the terms summative activities and formative, I think you use formative as well. No. They use, no, use informal, informal summative, performance, and summative. summative. All right, fine. But you didn't use formative. Why do you use informal, informal. activities? Because we're not grading them. Yes. So it's an informal process. So we're just basically measuring their what they have learned, but it's not really such a grading process. So we're not pressuring the students. And the students don't, don't even know that they're being assessed, so to speak. That's why we call it informal. All right. What? Anybody else has a comment on this in terms of your understanding of informal as opposed to formal? Anything you want to add? Subtract? Could this, could this also be considered as formative kind of a... Are you asking a question or are you making a statement? A question. It's a question. Okay. At this point, at this point, we're only making statements. Okay, so this, this could also be considered formative type activities. So he probably should have labeled it formative, no. you know, and not informal. But if, if it's going to be formative, that means that you're going to be grading the students. Uh, well, no, it's, 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 it's continuous and it's throughout the class and it's not, it doesn't necessarily need a grade. It is formative. Well, but for the definition, I don't remember it. Anybody else wants to come in on this discussion? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Agreement? I agree in terms of the term formative because formative is really continual assessment. So it is really for a student and it doesn't matter exactly what whether it's graded or not, as long as the students are are being are benefiting from it. And there's feedback. And the feedback is given. And uh, I, I it can also be both formal and formative assessment. It can be both when you look at it. That's correct. Yeah, those points that you have made are all correct. All right. So that's what I want to pick up on that. I just I just wondered why you, you persistently use informal, and I I thought when I was looking at you that you were not clear about formal and form informal and formative. 
And the last comment um, indicated that, yeah, you can have but, informal formative assessment. Well, I guess based on what uh, as I said, no, based on what I was reading, Miss, and, yeah. and formal and informal assessment was that they said that uh, formal assessments have data which support the conclusion made from the tests. Yes. And we usually refer to these type of tests as a standardized measure, while informal assessments are not data driven, but rather content and performance driven. Yes. So that is why I use informal assessment yes. instead of formal assessment. Yeah, I, I understand the point of view, but the point is that formative assessment is really meant to um, improve learning, and it's, it's usually done right throughout. And much of what we do in class, in fact, what I have just done is formal assessment. Okay. All right. I mean, that, that's the whole idea, to, to look at learning, to look at what you're understanding and address it, so that you address the gaps as, as, we, as we go along, right? Um, so we're clear on that. Performance assessment, what, 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 what is your take on that? Performance assessment, meaning that they're not really doing the selecting of response. They're basically given a question, and they're basically supposed to provide their own solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the definition that you are using of performance assessment. <laughs> that's my summary. <laughs> All right. That's your summary. <laughs> that's the su basically, it's a gist. All right. It's really a gist. Um, it, it is a gist that you have. And we're going to look at that. We're going to expand on that gist today because it's a little bit more than that. Um, but I, I, I can say, though, that there, you know, there, there's some who define performance assessment as narrowly as that. Meaning you're not doing no you're selecting, not or selecting or multiple choice or anything. So you're doing something, yes. But we're, gonna, we're gonna expand on that. All right. Okay. Now science. What is it that makes for student centeredness in your understanding of the term You spoke about um, the curriculum being student centered and activities was who was it we made we stopped and made the point yes <laughs> that we have selected these activities because they are student centered and the and the new curriculum um, addresses and requires yes and so I'm, I'm asking you what is it that you understand that to be One of my colleagues, do you want to take? <laughs> <laughs> You're the one who wants to make the point. Will my answer um, affect or? <laughs> it's okay. That's okay. It's okay. Go ahead. It's all Guys, about. It's, it's all learning. about. It's all about trying to make sure that we're on the same page. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what I understand is that a student-centered class involves. A the students doing most of the learning and the via their in involvement in whether researching the material by themselves or doing the activities in class by themselves and so as they learn as they as they do these activities they learn and as they learn, maybe the teachers don't have to do much, and so the teachers are just there to guide them. To say yes, you are correct, or yes, you are not correct. Somebody's coming in. If I can add to that, yes. If I, if I can add to that, this, this um, um, it might not be correct, but this is this is my understanding of it. Um, is the, the student-centered um, uh, learning approach? I think it actually came from that, that constructivist approach whereby the students actually are given the opportunity to construct their own learning. The, the, the activities and stuff that are, um, that are given to the students allow them to construct their own knowledge, to build on their own um, knowledge based on the activities and, um, and learning that, that are done. So it's more a constructivist approach whereby students construct their own knowledge I, um, with the help of teachers. All right. Now, what I, what I want us to do as we as we go with the discussion, because we, 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 we need to get to the bottom of this, is we're going to address 
what the previous person has said by saying so and so and so said x y z this is correct or i agree with this point but with respect to so and so i want to add or i want to subtract that way we can build yes then i also heard her mention that the new curriculum is more student-centered than roads and i don't know if you knew the intent of roads yes. it's similar to the intent of this national curriculum mm -hmm. So it's not that it wasn't student-centered, it's just what teachers did in the implementation. Yes. Um, yes. I, I do agree with Dr. McCollum because I think I catch the last thought of the rules. While the assessment were there, I think there weren't a lot of feedback. So the students did the activity, but the teachers following up with it was very so I think, so I think that's where the room went to be right. I'm not sure what it I think were, yes, the feedback was very poor, and the students were not moving or transforming as they would have wanted. I agree with, I agree with Sasha because as a student, when I did rules, I was wondering what's the point of this exam because we just did it and that yeah, was it. I didn't see anything happening after that, so I must agree with Sasha. Right, here is my question. Here is the point I want us to think about, and your key, right? No, what's your name again? Peter. made the point that in a student centered class, the students are really involved and pretty much involved in learning um, on their own. They are finding out, they are doing the activities to, to allow them to come to an understanding. And Mark refer to this as constructivist. The point you also, you also made the point that the teachers don't do as much. I want you to think about that statement. Really think about that. And I mean, everybody think about that statement that in a student centered environment, the teacher doesn't do as much. And I want you to tell me if that's really what I don't, I don't agree. If that's what. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I want to be clear. Yes. I don't want us to go off with that understanding. So no, maybe, maybe I didn't verbalize. I, I think. Tell me what you mean. Okay. Yeah. So, what is it? Go ahead. I'm, I'm thinking that uh, um, the old-fashioned way of teaching where the teacher stand up in front of the classroom and give everything, is everything, in terms of discovery learning, where the students now have to go and do a little discovery by, by themselves, a little um, self-learning. But that doesn't mean that the teacher is not going to do much because the teacher has to do much planning. Yes, Peter. Miss, I just want to clear up. Um, when I went to the NSC workshop, yes. I myself have one of the presenters said that the teachers will be doing more work because all of these planning of the activities is going to be um, a lot of work and sleepless nights. And so when I when I said the teacher is not going to do much, I don't mean I am, I am talking about in the classroom, but outside of the classroom, they would have to do a whole lot of work to plan all of these activities for each session they have on a daily basis. Yeah. However, in the classroom, it's going to seem to the students as if the teacher is not doing much. She just come, give us some stuff to do, and then she's there watching us and walking around and so forth. But they don't know the work that was put in outside of the classroom and, 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 and that's, that's good that's true and it's and also in the classroom the teacher is still doing much it's a different kind of much though yes <laughs> what is the much that the teacher is doing in the classroom Knowing how to lead the discussion, knowing yes. where are the gaps, how to pause, yes. how to where to stop. How to That's see. a lot of much. Of course. All right. I, I know you didn't mean well, that. Well, that's to do I it. Just <laughs> how you want them to, where you want them to be, to direct them and to say oh, to you. Oh, oh, precisely. So I, w I wanted to make that point because I just, I know that there's a, if there is a, a misconception, I think, among some, some teachers that once the students do the activities, 
busy work and then the students will necessarily get it and that's that's it it's not quite true i'm sure about it's not true for science and mathematics yes, i know it's a big um, misconception because yes. one time i was being assessed and my assessor said to me that I could give this activity to, to the student to do to mm -hmm. actually give the pressure of me. Oh. So yeah. it's a big misconception. It is indeed. Yeah. It is indeed. So it was like give this um, to the students and they present it to you and therefore you will actually take the pressure of yourself. Then you take the pressure of yourself by not speaking, but you still have to evaluate and give feedback and determine what next to do with respect to this topic that you're doing. So there's, you need to have, we need to have that balance. All right. Dr. Um, yes, Justin. Yeah, and just to um, agree with what has been said, um, I, I, and I can add to say that students, teachers actually may actually have more work doing than we actually did before. Because now, for every work that these students do, in order to ensure that there are misconceptions, you have to go to each person's work and give them feedback. And so as much as the fact that you are not standing up there, because when you are teaching, you are giving them the facts. But then when they are learning, you have to monitor them and ensure that they are getting it the way you want them to get it, because there will always be misconceptions from a lesson. And so it is important now to analyze what each student does. And at the end, we have a, a conclusion. Thank you, Joseph. All right. Now, I think you have, as I have said, managed to do what I had set out for you to do, which is to make the link between where Dr. Edward Kerr left you and where I want you to go. I'm going to go with you. And I wanted to use the opportunity to remind you of the importance of the level of the activity that we're asking students to do. Because there are some activities that are, they seem complex because of the words that you use to phrase the actual activity. But when you, when you drill down the nuts and bolts, they are really simple tasks. So you have to analyze and drill down. And you gave some interesting tasks, um, um, useful tasks, and both across science and math. I thought that you know you 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 you, you gave a good range of activities that students you could use for assessment. Um, I would just want to, well, I know for this activity we were looking at the, the assessment activities, you know, for, for the in that real sense. In the classroom, however, I wanted to make the point that there are limitations to the wide range, ranging use of a lot of activities, as you can well understand, because the, the um, time may not allow for you to do as many as you want. And so this whole notion of how you select becomes one of the very important things that as teachers, you're going to have to be able to address. And perhaps a good segue to the next section that I'm going to look at, which is looking at performance assessment. And I want to, I'm going to begin, and I just want to be clear. Are you, are you, have you, do you have something to munch on? Have you been able to pause? Should I, should I go full speed ahead? Or do you want me to pause now? I know you had your breakfast. Um, do you want me to give you a... A half an hour break at this point. Half an hour? Or, or should I go on? I, can I, I can't go on, you know. I'm asking you a question. Is it okay? Can I, should I continue? At one o'clock. One o'clock means. It's, I'd rather break now than at one. I mean, I mean when, I, when I start this, when I, when I start this, I want to move. I don't want to, I don't want to break in between the, you only have half an hour though. Half an hour. Okay, we'll All take right. a break now. Take a break.